Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm the second person who gives the talk on, uh, with the same title, Career Discovery Entrepreneurship. By good luck, uh, my talk is going to be completely different than the first one you heard, so I'd ask, I think there's not going to be a repetition. Uh, second point I want to make, I prepared for 20 minutes, but I realized I have to talk 15 minutes. So rather than talking too fast, I will just, during the slides, once in a while, point out only one point or not discuss the whole slide. If you have any questions afterwards, just come and see me. So, entrepreneurship. Just uh, four little pictures that, that shows a little bit what it means and what it takes. First of all, of course, you, you need an idea. If you don't have an idea, it won't work. Or you need a good friend who has an idea that also works. <laughs> Number two, you have to be really ready to leave your comfort zone. And that's something we have to realize, you know, it's, it's a different world. Point number three, uh, not every entrepreneurship has to create, not entre every entrepreneur has to create his own startup, but I think in our field that's more, le more or less what it comes down to. And uh, picture number four, you can make beautiful plans, but the reality looks quite different from, you, from what you imagined. So uh, uh, people like to talk about the valley of death in, uh, in biotechnology, uh, but that's a wrong term. It should be the valleys of death because there are so many stumbling blocks in the way. Good. Uh, in a little bit arbitrary, but I still think useful way, I divided for you the, the path from academia to a startup in four stages. Obviously, you have to go from the idea to a product. And never forget, the product is a key thing in biotechnology. And about half of the path, in terms, not necessarily in terms of time, but in terms of, of importance, is done in the academic lab. And the second half is done in the startup. So how come I say there are four stages? Well, uh, in the academic lab, you start with the academic research but then you need a phase of, let's say, one to two years of transitional research where you don't do f typical academic research anymore, but where you really focus on uh, the goal you want to reach. And then once you have to create a startup, you, you need some time to do R&D, research and development type of work, which needs to be, of course, very focused. And finally, you have to uh, produce your product. So those are the four stages I'm shortly going to talk to you about. And I will mention that during the course of the time, but the funding sources during these different stages are fundamentally different. So let's start first with the academic research. I think one thing you have to realize, your research has to be 100% solid and reproducible to go into biotech. And I say something that some people might not like, but results that are exciting but not sufficiently solid might be published in a high impact journal but for sure will kill your startup uh, company. So make sure everything you do is 100% solid and reproducible. You try to obtain intellectual property and uh, you should work together with your tech transfer office in Geneva would be Unitech. You have to see the business opportunity within the academic research results. And that is a distinction between a classical academic researcher and the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur, he will see the business opportunity that a classical academic researcher who might, makes fantastic research might not see. You need to define a first product, and that's something I was a hard time in the beginning. I thought showing the potential of the technology is enough, and that's not true. You need to show the people a product. And finally, you have to start building a team. And you have people with high visibility, and with uh, at least for some of them, you need people with complementary competences. So uh, I, uh, in my life so far, created five startup companies. I never jumped. I'm still a professor at the university. So you might say I'm a wimp. I'm not the one who dares to really go there. But uh, at least uh, I can make sort of scientific experiments. I can compare what worked in one co uh, company, what didn't work so well in the other one, what were the stumbling blocks. So I have at least some uh, experiences that. And two of these five companies I would call successful now. So let me shortly summarize these. Chenkutex uh, and Transcure. Uh, Chenkutex uh, is, a, um, 
is now on the stock market on Euronext, has a value of around 80, 80 million, but I'm so much diluted, I'm not rich, so don't, <laughs> don't think I, I own this. Uh, and Transcure is a is still privately owned company, so it's much more difficult to put a value on the companies, but it's certainly 10 times less. But the interest is, and this is what I'm going to show you, Jankutex does track development, Transcure does platform technology. If you have a platform technology, you need much less investment, you get much less diluted. So even if the company is 10 times, the worth is 10 times less, in terms for the, for the, for the founders of the company, financially it ends up being more or less the same story. So uh, now in terms of the academic science and the business opportunities, I want to compare a little bit you those, with, for, uh, for you these two companies. Uh, how did we create them? What happened? So Chenkutex, the basic science was the discovery of the Knox family of reactive oxygen species generating enzymes in my laboratory and in the laboratories some of the other co-founders. Uh, the idea was to develop new drugs that inhibit Knox enzymes. Transcure, a completely different story. Uh, to, working together with a colleague in, uh, in uh, Zurich, Roberto Speck, uh, uh, we worked on, uh, I mean, he mainly worked on humanized mice and that provide a first relevant animal model for HIV infection. And so the business opportunity we saw there was to provide a platform technology for experiments with humanized mice. Now, where would be the first product? We find NOx1, NOx4 inhibitors to treat fibrotic disease for Chancutex. And how did we uh, co uh, constitute our founder team? Here, really, we tried to collect internationally all the relevant people in the field and tell them, join us. We make one company together rather than everybody makes his own company. And that was probably the right thing to do. Uh, for Transcure, the first product was the test of HIV drugs in the humanized mouse model. In the meantime, we know that testing cancer drugs and drugs for inflammation makes even better business for the company, but we still needed to define a credible first product, and that was our testing the HIV drugs. And the, the strategy was quite different. In the uh, case of Transcure, we really mostly collected local players with complementary competences, and it worked also out pretty well. So I, I cannot tell you one or the other is the good way of collecting your team, but you sure should think hard about getting a good team together. Now we come to transitional research. Uh, everybody recognizes the guy on the right, which uh, symbolizes the product development. The guy on the left is Alexander von Humboldt, probably the last scientist, scientist he could claim that he understood the complete science and he wanted to understand the universe. Amazing guy, by the way. But that's what you have to do. You have to stop dreaming being Alexander von Humboldt and you have to become a product-oriented guy in the moment you come to the transitional research. So at this stage, you have to be really goal-oriented rather than a curiosity-driven research. You have to advance the project to a point that makes it attractive to seed investors. You try to involve the potential seed investors and business angels at this stage. That's something I think is very important. Don't think you finish your, your transitional research stage and then you talk to them. Talk to them as early as you can. And you have to consolidate a team who will have an operational role, who will be the scientific advisor. Me, for example, if I want to stay professor at the university, I will not be in the operational team, but I will be a scientific advisor. I will make my contribution to the work. So how did we do the whole thing for Chancutex and for Transcure? Chancutex, the transitional research, was essentially done in my lab. And as I uh, had an SNF grant on NOx enzymes, uh, that uh, was very reasonable to do it in that context. We got a lot of advice by the Geneva Biotech Incubator Eclosion, and it was fantastic because Benoit Dupuis, who is not a director here, he supervised our day-to-day -day business of our people, and uh, Jesus Martin Garcia did the business part, so we, we really were, were spoiled. Uh, and finally, to get the first results, I sent two of my lab members to the Broad Institute in Boston for a small molecule screen. This was still the good old times. You could go to the Broad Institute, you didn't pay anything, and you could do your screen for free. They would help you. They would give you all the machines. It was a really uh, lucky moment to do that. In the Transcure system, this uh, story was completely different. Essentially, uh, Roberto Speck was asked very often to perform experiments for the industry. 
And he started to be sick and tired of it, and he said, if I can outsource that to a company, I would be very happy. And that was one of the reasons Transcure was created. Uh, we didn't really have our advice like, uh, like of Eclosion, but we had a much more a varied founder team, and that also helped, I think, to make the whole thing uh, going. Uh, and finally, company scientists were trained in the Robertus Back Lab. So, so you see two approaches, very different, but both of them consistent, and at the end, they worked out. Now, the problem is, in these two cases, the funding for the transitional research worked, but in most cases, it's very difficult. And I think we're extremely lucky now in Switzerland, there's a new tool. Uh, it's, a, it's a combined uh, funding program by the, by the CTI, the so Commission, Commission for Technology and Innovation, and the Swiss National Foundation. Exactly for, that's what I call here transitional research. It's the so-called bridge program. There is one called proof of concept. This is basically for people like 90% of the audience here, postdoc, who would like to uh, create a, a startup company and they get one to one and a half year of funding uh, to do this transition, transitional research before they create their own company. But there's also a bigger, uh, more money program for uh, experienced researchers called Discovery. Uh, I quickly uh, show you uh, what you can get if you apply for this bridge proof of concept uh, support. I'm in this, in this, uh, in this uh, scientific committee, so I know this uh, relatively well. Uh, you can get up to 130,000 Swiss francs per year. Uh, you can be funded for 12 months with a possi possibility of six months extension. I think if the projects go well, you can count on the six months in addition. Now, uh, what do you need when you want to apply there to be successful? Well, uh, the most important part is a well-defined implementation plan. Most likely, you, it's going to end up with a startup company where you are the entrepreneur. If you say, I make a nice project that makes a patent and afterwards I go on staying in academia, you most likely will not get the money. You need a clearly defined first product. I already talked about it. And you, did, you need a convincing presentation because they know if you cannot present to the scientific committee, you will not be able to present to the investors. Okay, so this is, uh, this is about the phase of transi transitional research, and the aim of this phase is finally to get your company incorporated. So once you're at this stage, you have to find a company name. For the sake of simplicity, I call this new co now for, the, for this talk. There are a lot of theories how to give your names. Uh, I don't know. Uh, just find something. For our first company, Chenkutex, we didn't have any idea, so it was the beginning of the places where the founders were, Geneva, Kyoto, Texas. Everybody thought, told us it's crazy to call your company Chenkutex, but now everybody loves it because there's a little story to tell about the name of the company. Uh, uh, you have to think about the company premises, you have to think about the operational team, and you have to think very important about the seed investors. Company premises, uh, to make a story short, of course you can try to stay at the university, and of course you can uh, try to rent a private space, but in my experience, if you can manage to get in a biotech incubator, it's a very good solution for the beginning, because you will not be isolated, you will get help, administrative help from the people of the biotech incubator. If it's not possible, negotiate with your university or try to rent a private space. I'm out of time already. One minute and a half. <laughs> okay, you can create either uh, um, uh, uh, SARL costs, to, uh, you need to put 20,000 in there, or SA, you need to put 100,000 there. I think in most cases for, for a, a startup, you can stay with the SARL. Also, maybe a SA is taken more seriously. Seed investors, here you see a list. Uh, uh, this is really uh, the, a very important, at the same time, a very typ typical topic, a difficult topic. I mean, the amount of money you can get from the seed investor is maybe something in the range of 200,000 to 1 million, which is a bit optimistic, uh, Frank. Uh, for this amount of money, the seed investors typically want 10 to 50 percent of the company. So, uh, and, but of course, so investor shares will be issued you will be diluted. 
You should avoid that the seed investors get right away more than 50% of your shares because afterwards you don't have to say anymore. Uh, and uh, the seed investors usually ask preferential liquidation. Okay, we skip this part. And finally, the whole aim of the, uh, then we come to the R&D uh, region, it's uh, phase, it's absolutely crucial for the company. Uh, make sure all your resources focus on the development of the initial project. Make sure you have outside advisors. And the aim of the R&D is uh, the venture investment. And one more word for the venture investment and I'm ready. So uh, this is the money handshake that you get. Uh, I would call it a necessary nightmare for most companies. Uh, the communication between venture capital people and scientists can be very difficult. They drive a hard bargain, so you have to drive a hard bargain too, but not too hard because no investor can mean the end of your company. And what I learned is at the end of the day, those are, those are uh, intelligent and competent people. And once you're sitting in the same boat, they add something to your company that you could not have yourself. So at the end of the day, they do not only bring you money, but they also bring you competence in. So don't be too negative about the venture capital people. It's just the first step is very hard. And I think that's the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for your attention and happy to take questions.